Bloom. We're going to have presentations first on analytics, and then after that, kind of a bookend to it, we'll be talking about the public cloud. So Sumit, please take over. All right. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. All right. Um, my name is Sumit Sarkar. I'm the Chief Data Evangelist for Progress. And part of my job is uh, I, do, I run our developer relations program. Um, I do some product marketing. But I, I, I'm an advocate for data engineers in general. And so this session, I'm kind of going to beg you guys to help me out. And what I mean by that is you guys are building the next generation of modern cloud applications. And I just don't want you to leave my people behind. These are data engineers. And so that's what I'll show you and talk to you a little bit more about how you can do that, what that means, and make sure my people have frictionless access to data so they can do their own analytics. So we start with the, as we'll have a stat here, the embedded analytics market is estimated nearly double to 46 billion between 2016 and 2021. So these are our embedded analytics uh, applications and, and maybe services that you might run in your cloud. Uh, things like there's open source and commercial solutions like there's JasperSoft, there's MicroStrategy, Click, Logi, these different uh, analytics platforms you can embed into your business applications and clouds. And so that market is growing. And that same research firm also says that the advanced analytics market will be worth about 30 billion by 2019. And so this includes all the different advanced analytics tools that are doing descriptive, predictive, and you know, pro whatever, different types of analytics out there. And so there's a wide market growing here as well. Uh, and, and these, I don't think I'll get any of this money myself, but there's a lot of money being thrown around. And then there's also this trend. These are, this is where we talk about my people. So there's an increased demand for advanced analytics. So you, on the left, you've got the guys who are the data engineers, this uh, guy with the beard. And they're doing things from analytics context. They're taking, preparing, maybe munging data and making it ready for advanced analytics, machine learning, all these nice things you hear in the industry. And they have a different a set of tools that they are used to using uh, today. You may have these people. Actually, it might be in the audience. Anybody in here identify themselves as a data engineer? None? A couple? Oh, OK, there's a couple. All right. And on the right, we have some uh, data scientists. They're doing more of statistical programming, um, building models and predictions, whatnot. And they have a very specific skill set. They're pretty hot, and they have different tools and languages and frameworks they like. Anybody in here a data scientist? I know I heard some talks from some, and so I see a couple of hands and head nods, so I'll take that as yes. All right, so these are some of the groups that are looking for access to this data for their own analytics. And a lot of companies have growing practices. I work for Progress. We have a growing emergence, emerging data science practice. And if you look at some of the trends on DataCamp, uh, looks like on the left are the data engineers, about 85,000 open positions. On the right are the data scientists, 110,000 positions. And so these are some of the companies that are hiring them. I'm sure you guys are seeing this in your organizations as well. You have these guys coming on board. They're going to start asking you questions soon. And so when you stir in some clouds, and there's a lot of different clouds and markets. I mean, I think this conference, you guys are pretty much living this right now. We get some cloud infrastructure. And we throw in a pinch of data, there's lots of data. You see these slides every conference about how big data is growing and all the different frameworks, IoT and um, fast data. All this data is everywhere for analytics. And so we add that all together. And this is where we get the era of open analytics. And so you might be wondering, you know, what does that mean exactly? Um, and so what I'll say is like open analytics, you might have heard of, um, so when you, when you have cloud resident data, uh, it might be in different distributed databases. It might be behind APIs, whatever it is. Um, you want to make that data accessible to external, those people we talked about, data scientists and uh, data engineers. And so this is not a new concept necessarily. Uh, before your data was stored in databases, people could just access it directly, and they can get those detailed data that analytics professionals really like. But with this move to the cloud, uh, it complicates things a little bit. Now we're seeing. Um, microservices, containers, you know, cloud perimeter firewall networks, a lot of different areas are ma basically making this data inaccessible. And so this is what we're talking about. We're going to talk about how to expose this data for those data consumers. And I'll give you a textbook definition if you're still scratching your head, you know, well, what's this guy talking about? Um, so open analytics, this is a definition from Data NAMI article. Um, it's the integration of an open data access layer into business applications 
to be directly consumed by external analytics tools and popular programming languages, you know, yada, yada, yada. That's the textbook definition. But again, what does that really mean? And I think when you think of this term, I'm starting to hear around the conference even, you, know, you think about some of the services you guys are building, and you might expose it to externally as a public API. You might think of the Open API Initiative, um, or you might think of like an API management strategy so you can provision uh, your own APIs for your data. So this is kind of like an API management uh, or an API provisioning, but it's in laser focused on analytics professionals. And so we'll walk through an example that really help illustrate what we're talking about. All right, so let's take this uh, fictional application. It's a readmission application that's running in the cloud, and it has some embedded analytics built into it. So you can see in select a date range, you can get different characteristics about the, a medical condition, you know, the time frame, things like that. Right? This is what you'll see in a lot of applications, some kind of embedded intelligence. The answer to specific questions is driven by a user. And then let's say that you, know, you might want to create a map of all the hospitals where the readmission rates are getting higher. And there's actually a, uh, I think it's a Medicare program um, that's starting to penalize hospitals who have high readmission rates. And so there's in the best interest of hospitals to make sure they understand how they can control this cost and mitigate this against Medicare um, penalties. And so you might visualize this data in a chart. And so you know, we need to get that data out of our embedded cloud application and bring it into some other system or tool that we want that we can use to then visualize that data. So these are just, this is, this is a Power BI logo and you can visualize uh, data in a map and that. And there's a lot of other tools like that. Um, I'm gonna be walking back and forth to the hotel a couple more times, so I might become one of these dots in a second. But when we talk about this again, you've got this embedded analytics and then you might get questions from those data scientists, data engineers um, of your cloud applications. Like, well, I wanna build a predictive model for readmission so I can predict before it happens, maybe take action. Maybe I want to visualize the data that's blended with the hospital management system, and so that'd be valuable to get a better view of what's going on. I might want to ingest some of those detailed medical conditions and the line items into like maybe we have a data lake or a Hadoop cluster. And so some of the strategies to lower readmission rates are to make sure you do, when you discharge them from a hospital, you want to make sure you have coordinated with their primary care professional. Um, you want to make sure you've given clear outpatient instructions. So these are things you might want to start to analyze and see what's going on. Why are these rates going up? Um, and then maybe next thing you know, your CEO staff says, I want this report on my desk every morning at Monday at 9 a.m. And so all of a sudden you have a, another type of feature. And so this causes a lot, of, uh, a lot of pain for some of the cloud applications trying to support all of the analytics demands of these growing people. And so just give them the data in a nice open standard format, and make it frictionless, and all my people will be happy. I think I saw this guy in Times Square yesterday. He's kind of crazy. <laughs> but how, how can you give, how can your cloud app give data to every analytics tool and programming language and skill for everybody, right? There's, on the right, there's a whole ecosystem of analytics tools. So how can you provide this frictionless access? And so BYOA is an acronym for bring your own analytics and kind of like the bring your own device, you bring your own devices to work, you can do what you want. Well, bring your own analytics is becoming a mantra of these data professionals as well, and they wanna bring it to your cloud resident data. And further to these folks, this is a chart from Bark Research, and it shows some of the state of cloud analytics. And these are different tools out there, so you can see between 2013 and 2016, uh, you see what's growing. So BI tools are certainly growing as a percentage of users. And then BI servers, you know, with cloud computing, obviously BI servers might be distributed into the cloud. But the tools on the front end that these data engineers are using are growing. Data discovery tools, like that Power BI is an example of data discovery tools, growing quite 49% from 20%. Um, you know, you've got these analytics tools. This should decline, but really it's because there's two new categories of analytical applications and performance management tools. So there's a whole lot of new tools coming out there, and these we'll call citizen, some of these are citizen developers, some of them are data engineers, some are data scientists. There's more and more demand for frictionless access to your data. All right, so then we talk about open analytics strategies to deliver open interfaces for your cloud. You know, everything's open, um, and when we talk about open, we're not saying open source, we're talking about like a 
vendor agnostic uh, industry standards from multiple bodies. And I was in the break room before the speaker ready room. I think it was Don. I don't know if he's still here. And I was asking, you know, have you heard of OData, which is one of the standards in here? And I kind of expect people to say, ah, I'm not sure. You know, I think I've heard of it. And this guy is actually participating on the standard, so that was awesome. But these are the different data access approaches for open analytics strategies. You guys might know SQL. While it may, may, be, may not be the you know, front and center interface of your cloud strategy, it is what data scientists and data engineers, uh, it's a standard interface that most of these tools are supporting, so it's a very popular. The standards are ODBC and JDBC. Um, ODBC is popular with a lot of different platforms. JDBC is more Java-based applications. Um, a lot of analytics tools and frameworks are still based on these standards. And you can see on the right, you can see it supports a whole lot of different commercial off-the-shelf tools, open source tools. Uh, I think there's a new Apache project called Zeppelin. It's like a data discovery open source tool. Uh, then there's open like Hadoop and Spark and R, Java, all these different languages people want to consume data with, they can leverage some of these standards for SQL. And then when we go down to REST, right? REST is a, uh, we'll say it's a style to build an API. Um, OData is kind of the industry standard for building and deploying REST APIs. So this is um, also popular with the data visualization, data discovery kind of tools, cloud analytics, uh, and other areas, even application development. So this, again, these standards are widely supported by those bring your own analytics strategies and tools. And last one is if you have files, a lot of cloud applications can dump a CSV file, and you can quickly consume that as well. So a lot of different options. And at the end of the day, if you can support some of these or all of these, um, those business users will be able to have what we'll call a frictionless experience. So they can take their favorite platform or, or integration tool or analytics tool and just point it at a data source or your cloud data source, and they're reverse engineering metadata. They're often running without a lot of friction. And that, that's what it's all about. These guys are paid a lot of money, and it's not to like, figure out to learn your API, it's to, to start bringing business value with this data. So yeah, I'm pretty much begging you guys to, to consider these things when you're supporting your, your, let's say, your APIs and your microservices and things like that. All right, so then we talk about why this comes about in some cases. So with, we'll say a lot of this happens with the cloud, right? The clouds are disrupting data access for analytics. So you have stuff like SQL, which is a very structured query language. You have REST APIs. And so in that little cloud icon, there's a green database, right? So that, that may be distributed. It may be you know, part, tied to some microservice. Um, it could be you know, web scale, whatever it is. But it's locked behind that cloud firewall. And it's often you don't give direct access to these. It could be multi-tenant database. So in the, I guess, before in traditional architectures, um, you have access. No, you no longer have direct access to these detailed data for analytics. And then there's also a security piece. There's a lock, right? There's, you have this network. You can't necessarily, some, some companies are doing this. They set up a VPN so they can have database access because they'll just complain until they get what they want. Or they might have SSH tunnels and some things like that where you have to manage tickets. These aren't necessarily the most secure thing. Um, I know from a cloud operations folks that don't necessarily want to manage all these one-offs. Um, and so those are challenges with you know, giving SQL access to some of this stuff. And then when you look at REST, again, REST is not necessarily a, uh, standard, but OData is. So when you provide OData access into your cloud, you know, that, that does provide a much better experience for people. Uh, but on the downside, again, if you just have a, a REST API for analytics, each REST API is very different. So that causes um, your data consumers to have to learn your API, and they may deal with 50 of them. And so that just causes them to um, not be as productive with your data. And so if you look at a closer look behind the example we gave earlier with the hospital readmission application. Now, I'm not trying to show, this is a very simplistic view. I'm not trying to show the best practices in um, deploying uh, cloud native applications, but we're showing you the concept, right? There's, there's some kind of, in that cloud application, there's some kind of, uh, we'll say, a relational database that's storing some systems of record. Um, and then on the back end to support the analytics piece, there's some kind of data integration step that happens, maybe data preparation, integration tool. Um, or process or service that happens, and then there's, I guess, maybe persistent an analytics data model so that your embedded analytics can better interact with that data. You can do drill up, drill down, things like that. And that's the traditional architecture. Then it may, a BI server might connect to it in your cloud, uh, and you get that nice chart, uh, this number one, embedded analytics. And then number two, when we talk about that use case of visualizing that map, Really, the open analytics strategy is one where you deploy that open data access layer on top of 
whether it's an API or an analytics database, you get that standard SQL, um, your industry standard REST interface with OData or a CSV file. And, and that's really what we're talking about with open analytics is thinking in this term of making whatever data you can that might be interesting to your consumers. And I've talked to a lot of cloud vendors from different companies and it's always interesting to them because they were like, why would anybody want audit data? Why would anybody want these machine data? But there's always somebody who benefits from business value from this stuff as these data science practices are growing. And this, this is really a, a great strategy to get, to get the data in more hands of folks. And of course, I'm saying it in an open, free way. Obviously, we understand security is very important and things like that. But generally speaking, the main part is about building through these standards so that your tools can access them very easily. And so you might be wondering, why do I care about all these uh, industry standards? So my employer, Progress, uh, has a long history and heritage in working on and founding a lot of these standards. So the ODBC is the oldest standard. It's a SQL based on relational databases. Uh, so we co-founded the specification um, way back when, 92. And then with JDBC, we we're members of the expert group, and that came about with the advent of Java programming, so we needed a data access standard. AODO.net, the other stuff going on there is under NDA, so I didn't put anything on there. And then OData, that's the latest standard. It was up for ISO, so it's an internationally accepted standard as of February 2017. And my employer, Progress, was the first to join that committee. So we're very active in all these standards and driving these forward. And so we see a lot of requests coming in. We're like, okay, these, these crazy guys are trying to deploy this uh, new cloud architecture with these modern interfaces and is putting you know, pressure on how these standards work. So we're always looking to adopt and advance these standards in response to how your applications are deployed. For anal and primarily, we're looking at it from an analytics perspective, but these can be applied, like OData can be applied for anything as a REST API. All right, so how do you deliver this open analytics for your cloud application, let's say? So you know, what do I do? There's a couple options we talked about a little bit. Um, the first one is like a strategy to just kind of export your data, maybe a flat file. And so the positives about that is that you know, it's really you, you kind of give a file to somebody, they can easily consume it with a, a desktop tool, and they can be off and running with that data. That, that works nicely. Um, the, the downsides of it are, I've seen this a lot, is that it works okay for like very one-off ad hoc things, but when you try to make something in production or you want to stream data into some kind of process, you kind of need a live connection, and that, that doesn't work so well. But it's certainly... Uh, a very, it's a great first step to make it easy to export relevant data for people. And I think a, a lot of cloud applications uh, provide support for this in some way. Database replication is another option we've seen a lot with cloud vendors. Um, they might take some data set and they'll just replicate it out to some third party database. Maybe their customer brings it themselves, maybe you provision the cloud. Um, but that's, you know, that gives them access, that gives them database access to do whatever they want with their favorite tools, and it works. Uh, the downside, a lot of cloud vendors don't necessarily want to add complexity, or if they have growing data volumes, they have to start thinking about scale. I mean, maybe if you use something like a, an Amazon Redshift, I mean, you can certainly keep scaling, but it'll cost you. There's a lot of different trade-offs, a lot of different options, but database replication is certainly a popular um, option to open up analytics to your cloud data. REST APIs. So REST APIs, we talked about there, it being, every, a lot of cloud apps have REST APIs, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy for uh, my people to consume. So again, OData is really what we are promoting as a way to expose data in an interoperable standard way to provide that easy experience. Um, and then database access directly. So I know it sounds kind of scary, like who's gonna open up a hole in their cloud perimeter network or who's gonna give direct database access? Um, but there's a lot of companies out there that are finding creative strategies. I mean, Progress, my employer, we have commercial solutions to make this easier, things like accessing database through a, we'll call it a uh, service. We have a pipeline to expose uh, your database layer either through your business logic APIs and provide SQL interface or maybe directly uh, over HTTPS into your analytics database depending on what you have. So we have, um, we have worked with a lot of cloud vendors to, to provide this access as well. So these are four common strategies. And one thing I, I think is very interesting is when we think about exposing data, the data engineers, um, one of the challenges, we expose data, a lot of times you might do an API, expose some business logic or some aggregate data, but the value of analytics is in the details. And so if you can see in this chart, right, we, we can't just expose aggregate data. This is an example of some marketing uh, type of a work uh, use case, but the detailed data is where you get some, some of the most value in the big data and statistical analysis, right? Segment and summarized data is also important for some of those embedded BI and reporting or dashboarding, but don't, like you can't just, I guess our, our message is, 
we always see this. They, you expose some data through APIs, they keep wanting more to almost like a back and forth that never ends. So just think about the details of data you're exposing in some of your APIs and engineer them for maybe bulk access and try to, uh, you guys do all the magic of sizing and, and capacity planning and architecting these services, so that's, leave it to the experts. Um, and then we talked about APIs, REST APIs and friction. This is a friction, because I want to get my, this is the API to access all of Progress's marketing activity data. And so this is not, so, so for my data engineers on my team, they don't want to have to learn this and then learn the next one for our next CRM and then the next one for our quote system. You don't have to learn 10 APIs, right? So this is a REST API, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have a, the best open analytics strategy. If you expose this through the OData standard, then you get to leverage the semantics of that standard and any tool will work. You'll be able to just to interrogate the metadata, you'll be able to grab an object, you'll be able to access this preview and page the data in a standard interoperable way rather than having to learn each API independently. I'm not gonna name that cloud vendor because we're a customer of theirs. Um, and then again, the cloud, we get database access. How do you provide access into your database, right? So there's, there's a lot of strategy. Progress, we use reverse proxy service for e-commerce site to get through firewalls. Um, we have VPN set up uh, in some cases for some of the stuff we have hosted. Um, sometimes we use SSH tunnels to, to just to maybe do an ad hoc exploration of data. So there are a lot of different ways to get through it, but it's not necessarily one standard way for cloud, and cloud vendors. Um, we do have a solution for that, but I'm not gonna you can go by and chat with us later about that. Um, but those are some of the challenges, uh, I think, that uh, or things to think about with these open analytics strategies. All right, so let's talk about who's, who's delivering some of this stuff. And so we look at, these are just a list of some of the uh, SaaS vendors out there um, delivering either SQL access through ODBC and JDBC or OData. And there's a good number of folks on here that are either delivering it as part of their cloud or maybe through some partnership. Uh, a, lot, a lot of folks know who Salesforce is, uh, you know, Oracle applications, Marketo. Um, so some of them are doing a mix, right? There's, some of these guys are exposing SQL access to an analytics database through firewall-friendly kind of a, architecture. Some are exposing through a SQL interface against their API. So it's kind of an interesting concept, but you can put a SQL interface and make it compatible with analytics tools on top of like your public APIs and microservices and things like that. Uh, so interesting concept um, that some of these vendors are doing. Like if you think about, uh, um, I believe it's uh, Oracle Service Cloud um, has SQL modeled against their public REST APIs. I think NetSuite as well. So it's a good list of companies, and they mix a support a host of these. So for me, I can plug that data discovery tool and just point at an endpoint, or OData endpoint, in any of these supporting applications that I'm off and running. It's very cool stuff from our perspective. And then think about cloud apps as you got, they become more and more popular over time as you deploy them. And so this is an example of 10 of the largest tenants for Oracle Service Cloud. So this is the 10 of their largest customers. In blue is the, the primary data for their application, red's audit, and green is the secondary data. This is stuff that their customers are loading into their cloud because they want to access it natively. And so there's a lot more data growing in these clouds, so making your data available becomes even more compelling because they almost are becoming, they're sucking in all the data and becoming systems of, of record and in some cases providing larger views than just your application, become like a, almost like a SaaS warehouse of a bunch of stuff. So we've seen that trend. And we ran a survey, um, which is the Progress Global Connected CRM Leaders, and it, it really, we're contrasting all the ways these applications are connected. Um, so you may not be able to read them very well, but the top line on the left is support for this open analytics concept we're talking about, and you can we rank them, Salesforce and Dynamics are certainly doing, got a higher score. And there's other areas, like how do they consume external data, what integration patterns they have, um, so on and so forth, but uh, there's a lot of different areas. And we have this white paper, you can read all the details from our website if you like. And then on the right we talk about, this, this highlights the differences, right? We talk about each SaaS API, and this is just SaaS CRMs, they're not necessarily all the same. So we see that for a query language, you know, some of them support a standard query language, like Salesforce has SQL. Um, well, it's not a standard query, it's a query language, it's a subset of SQL, but then SAP and Microsoft Dynamics, have they support OData to query data out of their applications, and then the other two uh, don't necessarily have a query language uh, that's published. Um, and so there's a lot of different nuances and things to think about. Again, this comes back to the whole friction experience. So uh, again, OData has, a, has been a very popular for cloud applications to expose data. Okay, so, so then what, 
we talked about OData. I'm going to keep, I think SQL, people widely know how SQL works and, and how, how um, the power of having SQL for analytics type of professionals. But let's get into OData because it's a newer, it was just inter ratifies international standard in February. Um, so what is an open REST API when you think about that? So REST, again, REST is great. Uh, but again, from a perspective of analytics and data management where we rely on interoperability, um, it's not a standard. It has uh, limited querying capabilities in a lot of cases. I mean, some REST APIs are fantastic, but um, it's a different experience across the board. And then metadata support, you know, REST as a style doesn't say you should surface metadata in this way, and this is what you should level of detail. So having said that, it's not necessarily ideal for our, for we'll say my people. And then, again, OData is the open REST standard, and there's a little bit of a timeline. So it's an open protocol that gives you some semantics and, and different um, ways to make it interoperable REST API. It gives you best practices and how to um, set up queries and how to represent your objects. And it's an OASIS standard. And some people call it SQL for the web. I don't, from analytics perspective, that's fine, but I don't think it's um, isolated to just being for querying. It uh, certainly can be used in every, any REST API like you saw for the CRM vendors. And then it, you know, it's approved again by ISO 2017. Before that was an OASIS standard in 2014. And then it was originally founded by Microsoft. I forgot the date. But that's where the, its heritage is from. Uh, and so that's, this is what OData is. And I'll show you a little bit more about it. But again, we work on the OData technical committee. So we are helping to drive that standard forward. And so, with OData, and this, hope I don't want to get into a religious debate with anybody, but this is just talking about some of the other REST, uh, we'll say APIs to query data. So there's OData is one we, we contrast. GraphQL, if anybody heard of GraphQL, it's a Facebook uh, API query language. Uh, it's very popular with, uh, like every time you load a Facebook page, it uses GraphQL to, um, to render the page and the data. And then ORDS is an Oracle REST data services. Anytime you have an Oracle database, you can deploy an ORDS service. And so when you contrast these, you can see why we like OData. It, you can get the best experience for working with data through querying capabilities. Like you can filter, get ordering operations, joining and paging. There are aggregation extensions in OData now. Um, so that's why um, these analytics vendors are building their applications to support OData because of its rich query capabilities. GraphQL is certainly an interesting standard, but as a standard, it doesn't necessarily define all these things because they don't want to impose um, these, these rules on top of the backend API. So GraphQL and OData solve very different things. I don't want you to think they're head to head. Um, we can chat about it later. People are always yelling at me on my blog about the difference and telling me I'm stupid, but you know, we, that's how blogs work. And then ORDS, again, is the Oracle service, so it has its own, um, it also has its own limitations in terms of querying and joining in other areas. It's very database centric. You pass SQL statements to do different things. And then when we look at surfacing metadata, it's a very hard slide to read possibly, but the more metadata you provide, the more data-driven standard applications can give you the best data acquisition experience. And so OData has the richest support for different concepts, has a schema metadata, object metadata, but when you get down to different resources, it has data types, scale, scale and precision, primary keys, um, descriptions, nullability, all these little details. You may not care about them, but with that, again, this comes back to the whole thing of being able to work with with these APIs without having to learn each one individually. You get a standard experience across each one. And if your cloud apps can support these, uh, you'll, you'll build the OData endpoint and you'll be able to represent these and then people are off and running and just pasting you endpoints into applications. And so I hope that makes, I was gonna see if I'd beg you guys, but I don't know if that'll help. But I do wanna chat with you guys later if you have questions and progress is sponsoring this event, so we have a booth. I forget the number, but um, it's a green arrow looking thing, like a superhero. I don't think I have any progress gear on, but we'd love to chat with you guys about what you're building, um, if we can help uh, help you guys, if this is interesting enough to you guys to support, uh, if you're getting demand for it yet. But again, I wanted to plant this seed early with you guys, because you guys are definitely on the cutting edge of building out cloud applications infrastructure. So I really appreciate you guys' time this afternoon. Great.